Good morning. We're just about getting ready to get started, so if you want to make your way forward, there's plenty of seating in the front. Don't feel shy. Everybody's presentation is open. Good morning once again. Um, I'm Ritu Agarwal. I'm a professor of information systems at the Smith School of Business. I'm also the director of the Center for Health Information and Decision Systems. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our first panel for the sixth annual Public Health Research Day, as we heard this morning. Uh, my co-moderator for the panel is Dr. Mark Zubrov. Uh, and our panel is focused on understanding, uh, you know, which very fittingly following uh, Richard Bresser's talk on how technology can help healthy behaviors. We have an outstanding team of panelists who are going to try and um, attack the conundrum of healthy behavior from different perspectives. So we have representatives from the clinical community, representatives from the policy community, and then of course the uh, uh, practice community without whose help we couldn't take this engine forward. Uh, so the way we are going to run this panel is I will start off and spend a little bit of time, just about five or seven minutes, uh, framing the issue and talking about some of the work that we've been doing at the Center for Health Information and Decision Systems. Uh, then we'll have each of our panelists uh, talk for about 10 minutes uh, from their perspective on the question of how technology can support healthy behavior. And we're going to start off with Nanette, uh, who will give us uh, the view from the clinical side. I'm sure you've had a chance to read the panelists' bios. They have extremely impressive credentials, and uh, it's a privilege for us to have them talk to us today. Uh, then we have uh, Praduman Jain. We only know him as PJ, so feel free to call him PJ. Uh, he is um, he's a, a multifaceted genius. I like to think of him that way, because he has a foot in uh, the practice, in the policy, as well as the research communities. So uh, PJ has been a serial entrepreneur in the health technology space, and he's involved in some very exciting work, uh, which he's going to share with us today. Uh, and after that, we have the policy view from Angela Ivette, who is the Chief of Health Information Exchange at the Maryland Healthcare Commission. Uh, as you know, Maryland stood up uh, one of the earlier health information exchanges called CRISP, the Chesapeake Area Regional Information Systems for our patients. I always get that wrong, but I think I'm close. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um, at my center, we had an opportunity to work with CRISP in some of the early days uh, of their work. And as you know, the problem of getting information to flow from one part of the healthcare ecosystem uh, to another part where it's needed is probably uh, one of the most critical obstacles that prevents healthy behavior. So uh, the HIE is doing important work, and of course, uh, Angela is going to tell us a little bit about that. And then Mark is going to come in at the end and uh, wrap things up. You know, we hope to have a very interactive panel discussion. Uh, as Dushanka said this morning, some of the feedback from the earlier days has been, uh, why don't we engage the audience more? So we're absolutely going to do that. So let me start with some introductory remarks uh, from my perspective on how uh, to think about uh, the relationship between technology and healthy behavior. And I have my own President Obama story. It's not as good as Richard Besser's, uh, but it is still a President Obama story, not as entertaining. So just to set the context, it isn't often that a president invokes the power of technology in an inaugural speech. 
Uh, and I don't know if you all recall, but this particular sentence from President Obama's inauguration in 2009 uh, struck a real chord with me. He said, we will wield technology's wonders to raise healthcare quality and lower its, its cost. Uh, we heard from Richard Bresser about how uh, you know, life expectancy in the US is lower than other industrialized nations, and of course, uh, I don't think it's unknown to anybody in this room that the US spends you know, over $9,000 uh, per capita annually on healthcare, which is at least three times our closest competitor. So these numbers don't look good, and to the extent that we can use technology to address some of these persistent deficiencies in the healthcare system, I think we will be in a better place. So that's the big picture. What happened after this uh, inauguration address and contemporaneously with it, we saw some of the most powerful legislation being passed in the United States that really represents what I think of as an inflection point for the digitization of healthcare. In 2009, we had the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, or the HITECH Act passed, uh, which accelerated the adoption of EMRs. And then in 2010, the ACA picked up on a lot of the uh, high-tech initiatives and started pushing things like transparency, the use of data for uh, better uh, clinical decision making, the use of data for prevention, and so forth. So by around 2010, or since around 2010, you know, the train has left the station, proverbially speaking, as far as digitization of healthcare is concerned, and now we have to start worrying about, well, how do we extract the maximum possible value from this digital transformation? So we know changing healthy behaviors is hard. Uh, we've had decades of psychology, uh, psychology research telling us that uh, perhaps the most difficult thing to nudge is a, a hab habituated set of activities that people engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is a complex challenge, um, uh, and uh, our puzzle, our scientific puzzle, is to figure out how to nudge that in the right direction the nudge being some intervention or some movement that you make at a specific point in time. So how can technology help us overcome uh, the challenge of, of inducing healthy behavior? Uh, you know, I would argue that there are many ways in which technology would help, but I'm going to focus specifically on just three ways that are going to get reflected in some of our uh, presentations coming along. Uh, one. Technology helps us get access to information. Information is critical for all decision making. Information is important for empowerment. Information is important for making the right choices. And in the absence of information, we will end up making decisions that are not optimal. So the power of technology comes from its ability to informate different actors within the healthcare system, different organizations within the healthcare system. Second, Healthy behavior is all about a motivation problem. And motivations can be triggered at appropriate points in time. Motivation can be triggered, motivations can be triggered by, um, uh, by enticing certain human, basic human traits, uh, our desire for competition, our desire to win, our desire to help others basic human tendencies that will drive incentives or put in place the right kinds of incentives for healthy behavior. So we can use technology to increase motivation. And then finally, uh, you know, to the extent that interventions are not a one-size-fits-all type of thing, um, the power of data and the power of technology that allows us to process that data comes from our ability to more precisely target interventions at the exact time, the exact place, and the exact person for whom it will work. So let me present some examples of these three um, forms of assistance that technology can provide. Uh, in information, we've seen uh, striking and remarkable growth in mobile health. We'll hear about that a little bit later. Uh, we do know that there's a wide range of additional services that mobile health applications provide us with. And the transformation potential is pretty incredible. And if you think about the next generation of healthcare consumers who, uh, you know, for whom the mobile phone is almost uh, another limb, 
uh, they're not going to consume healthcare the way we do, and their expectations about what technology can do to take out some of the irritation, to take out some of the uh, inconvenience of consuming healthcare, their expectations are going to be completely different. Um, for information, I'll share with you another couple of powerful stories. I don't know if you recognize the woman on your left. That's Jessie Grumman. Uh, she was a four-time uh, cancer survivor and then a fifth cancer hit her. Uh, Jessie has a PhD in sociology from Columbia University, so she's not your average person on the street. And she wrote in an article in Health Affairs in 2013, I searched online for comparative quality information on surgeons specializing in stomach cancer, and I found that that was virtually non-existent. This is Jessie talking, Jessie looking for information that she didn't find. So imagine uh, what, you know, from a health equity perspective, what about the poor, uneducated person who doesn't know where to go access this information? One of the powerful um, implications and impacts of technology has been in the rise of user-generated content, which is very value-producing for the healthcare sector. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but we've done studies on trying to understand how uh, patients' ratings of doctors help drive better decision-making, as a result, help drive better adherence, and ultimately lead to better health outcomes for the patients. The second picture on the right uh, talks about a health equity story where we see virtual communities around rare diseases. Lori Edwards suffered from a rare disease called PCD, or primary ciliary dyskinesia. I'm sure many of you have not heard of this because it is indeed a rare disease. She was not able to find people like her with whom she could share disease experiences, so she was living in an information vacuum. She went online, connected with people. So one of the empowering potential applications of technology is to just help people who need help connect with each other and share insights about their disease conditions. And this was an article in uh, the New York Times in March 2016 uh, saying we're more honest with our phones than with our doctors. I bring this up as an example of how information captured in cell phones is being used to address uh, sensitive issues around women's health, which they may not feel comfortable sharing with their practitioners or doctors, but they will certainly feel comfortable sharing with their cell phones. All right, moving on uh, to the next potential value-creating area for technology, the quantified self-movement, where you know we're fitted with uh, sensors and other tracking devices and other devices that support measurement throughout our bodies can be enormously motivating. Uh, I know my husband's been trying to lose weight using an app, and one of the most motivating things for him is to look at how many calories he's consumed and to know that he has control over how many calories are going to go into his stomach the next time. So robust opportunities for new services using wireless uh, wearables and IoT technologies. Um, Games for Health, which is the next frontier in motivation. I spoke about, you know, sort of, uh, awakening our inner competitive uh, spirit, and that's what the Games for Health movement is trying to do, so linking people up in teams, having them compete with each other, and improving outcomes that way. And then the final area I want to spend a couple of minutes on uh, is this whole idea of precision medicine, the holy grail where technology can help. Uh, what this picture shows is we have lots of different people in the world, and they all look very different, and they have very different needs. Uh, so precision medicine in this context, it's not about finding the exact treatment for a particular genetic makeup, but it's about using health technologies and design features in systems that are targeted to a segment of one. To do this, we need to unleash the power of some of today's technologies around big data, artificial intelligence, and advanced analytics. And a real quick example on where we've done this, one of my doctoral students has just finished a study uh, on using mobile cell phones to motivate uh, people to run more in a physical activity community and leveraging their social connections, so sending messages from a friend and asking them to run in a challenge to send something back to their friend. And the 
effects of this intervention, I think the graph on the right shows it all. The reciprocity treatment has a significantly higher uh, weekly running record than any of the other treatments. And the media is not far behind in recognizing this potential, the recent cover from The Economist, Dr. Yu. And then finally, I always like to follow the money. So this chart shows you uh, how investments in uh, health technology for supporting healthy behaviors are go growing. Overall, 21% uh, per annum increase, but strikingly in wireless health, it's 23%, and in mobile health, it's 41%. So we, uh, we have some preview uh, as to where the market is evolving with respect to these technologies. So let me just conclude by saying my perspective uh, I very strongly believe that digital technology and data are going to create some very enduring, some very fundamental, very profound changes in how we think about the practice and delivery of healthcare. Uh, and for us as researchers uh, and the work that my center does is really focused on uh, two issues. One is building out the evidence base, the research, for what works under what circumstances and for whom, uh, the precision medicine targeting piece and second, what processes should we be putting in place for capturing data? What tools do we need to use for more precise and more timely e analysis and extraction of insights? So with that, uh, I'll stop. If there's one or two quick questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll hand over to our next panelist. Any questions? All right. So let me invite Nanette. Give us her perspective. Good morning, and I want to first thank uh, Ritu and uh, the others who, for the opportunity to be here with you today. I, as was previously mentioned, am a, an endocrinologist. My primary appointment is at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. I also have an appointment at the Baltimore VA. I'm very much involved in providing clinical care. Uh, to patients, various uh, research efforts. And several years ago, I was approached uh, to see if we might uh, collaborate with Ritu and her group to see if we could uh, bring technology into the clinical space. And what I want to share with you today is a, is a pilot, a discussion about a pilot study is very preliminary at this point, but we'll share with you some of the challenges and, and the things that we've discovered so far. Um, so as you've heard this morning, and we all know that uh, healthy behaviors is really the, the core of many approaches towards not only health, but uh, turning the, the disease tide. So for example, uh, physical activity, healthy diet is important to reduce risk for obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. These are the major non-communicable diseases that that are killing not only Americans, but uh, individuals throughout the world. And so what we really want to do is ask the question, can we use technology in ways to help promote digital therapy, uh, to promote health? And I personally think the answer is yes, uh, that we can uh, use this modality, that it can be a very powerful tool uh, to help uh, not only promote health, but also uh, turn disease around. So as I mentioned, I spend uh, the majority of my time dealing with type 2 diabetes. And at the core of type 2 diabetes is promoting physical activity, promoting healthy behaviors. Um, patients who have type 2 diabetes, actually, if they implement all of the activity that we ask them to do, they spend about four hours a day or a part-time job. Uh, managing their health. So it's it's not a small task, and we, rec we 
need to recognize that. And um, when the diagnosis is made or when pa patients are at risk for diabetes, education is, is a really important tool. And again, digital therapy can be used, digital approaches to enforce, reinforce education. Uh, we need to have structured approaches. We need approaches that are cost effective, that are widely available and evidence-based. And the use of, of mobile technology can, uh, in a cost-effective way, uh, implement these very basic elements of caring for patients. And I'm going to, again, the, the data that we have is focused on type 2 diabetes, but it can be applied very broadly over uh, a number of, of disease types. So um, I'm personally involved in in several types of approaches um, at the VA. In particular, we're using telemedicine and home health. So for example, a patient with type 2 diabetes who has blood sugars that are fluctuating high and low, uh, we enroll them in a telehealth program where there's a nurse who uh, communicates on a weekly basis with the patient. They are given a, a specific glucose meter that in addition to recording their blood sugars uh, throughout the day, the patient then inserts the meter into the phone, and that data then is transmitted to uh, the VA facility. We then um, receive that information in the medical record and can communicate with the patient. So that's just one way in the tra that we can uh, improve communication, uh, collect data from patients, analyze the data and impact their care. In the traditional care model, uh, the patient would use a, a device that's about the size of this pointer and collect their blood sugar data over a period of many weeks or even months. And then they come to their appointment, and we have three months of data here, and what we really need to do is communicate on a more regular basis about what's going on with the patient on the day-to-day -day basis rather than exclusively looking at what's happening in their lives uh, during their, their uh, visits. And so what, what I really uh, promote is the idea of, again, better communication with the healthcare team, better collection of healthcare data, and then um, coming to uh, be able to intervene uh, s sooner uh, rather than at periodic visits. There are many uh, web-based interventions that are available. I'm not going to talk uh, in detail about those, but uh, for example, uh, diabetes has been shown to be a preventable, delayable condition. And we really, as uh, healthcare professionals and, and public health uh, providers, need to ramp up diabetes prevention. And there are commercial products, um, organizations that have programs that are uh, web-based that individuals can go to and uh, engage in diabetes prevention. Uh, there are other programs, for example, that involve the, the smartphone and, and messaging, as, as Ritu mentioned. Again, for diabetes, the patients would uh, message to a, a provider what their blood sugars are and then receive back a text message to tell them, you know, change your medication dose to this rather than that. And uh, so lots of approaches in terms of digital help uh, for uh, disease management. And then mobile apps. There are hundreds and hundreds of apps that have been developed to do nutrition, physical activity, <coughs> weight management, hundreds of apps uh, for diabetes, for example. And what we, again, need is to be able to look at those apps, to gather the data, and see are they really effective? And how can we integrate that information with the healthcare record, to engage the healthcare team with, um, with the patient? So with that, um, I, I will talk a bit about the, uh, the program that we did. M uh, health or mobile health has been shown to help reduce costs, healthcare costs. So we saw this morning that um, the United States spends more than any other country on their health care. And mobile health uh, initiatives can actually effectively help lower the cost. 
It improves communication with the healthcare team, uh, the coaching. So, you know, if somebody wants to change their diet and get information about what should I eat today, tomorrow, to receive the feedback. Look, you were successful in reducing your caloric intake by 200 calories yesterday. Way to go. Those types of motivational features can be um, effectively used through M Health. And the, the, the data that is available, and this is a study that looked at uh, prospective uh, trials looking at M Health, show that for diabetes, for example, uh, care can be improved. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is a, a three month measure, sort of a snapshot. Uh, that tells us on average how close to normal is the blood sugar. So that data point is improved by a half to 1%, which is clinically significant by users of, M of M Health. And the other thing that that particular study showed is that younger patients tend to benefit more. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask with um, collaborators uh, at the Smith School of, of Business was, well, can we engage older people? And um, what other specific personality traits, how can we individualize the therapy? So um, this was a, a, a pilot study that was done uh, two to three years ago at the VA. And what we uh, did was we asked uh, patients who were older than 60 with established type two diabetes, would they be interested in participating in a trial where they would be provided with an app. We gave them a, um, a tablet that had the app preloaded on it. They were provided with uh, internet service. And um, so would they be willing to use this app to engage with the team so that we could collect data? There were four uh, groups. There was a control group. So the people that ended up being uh, randomized to the control had usual care. And usual care is typically an every three month visit with a diabetes or a primary care uh, provider to discuss diabetes and their, their health care uh, diabetes management. So the second group got the app. And in the app, they were asked to um, record their blood sugar, to tell us whether or not they exercised to state whether or not they took their medications and to provide information about their food choices. And we assigned somewhat arbitrarily, I would say, points. And so if a patient took their uh, medicine uh, that day, they were given points. If they took, you know, checked their blood sugar, we didn't give them points for how well controlled they were, but just whether or not they checked their blood sugar. So they got points. Uh, so that was the, the second group with the app. The third group had the app with a live ability to communicate with a certified diabetes educator. So they could get uh, direct feedback. The fourth group uh, was uh, assigned with, uh, in teams so that they were competing. So it had that gaming feature. They were competing with each other. Um, you know, my blood sugar is better than yours, my weight's better than yours, sort of thing. Um, it, it was, again, a small study, not, not many, many patients, but those were sort of the, the design features. And we also um, looked at personality traits, and the tool that we used assessed two traits. One um, was uh, assessment. Those are the people that think about things, um, you know, hmm. Should I do this or should I do that? Those are the assessors or the locomotors who are the, the just do it. I'm just going to do it. So what we actually found is, is in our cohort was that those who were high in assessment had better adherence to their, their medical care plan. And those with the low assessment had decreased adherence over time. Well, that doesn't seem very surprising. The locomotors, the just do it, had higher adherence early uh, in, in the trial. We followed these patients for three months. Um, so it wasn't a, a very long uh, study. And then we found that you know the just do it people, really enthusiastic early on, but t tended to uh, go down overall. Um, there was also, uh, we just looked at overall adherence, engagement with the app, 
And what this uh, data shows is that the more, of course, adherent a person was, their hemoglobin A1C uh, tended to improve. Uh, and those who were not as adherent, uh, their, their hemoglobin A1Cs changed uh, very little. So what we really want to do is, um, what we found also is that, yes, older patients will engage with a, with a tablet. Uh, they may engage with phones as well. Uh, what we'd like to do next is take this to a larger cohort and uh, see what we can do, A, to standardize care, because like I said, there are many, many apps out there, and we really want to know what features uh, need to be present uh, that will improve care. How can we personalize it? One size does not fit all. Do we need to do you know, personality assessments to find who works better on a team versus who's the person that's going to work better on one-to-one? -one? And then how can we integrate this uh, with our healthcare system? For, and, and for me, I think one of the main issues with the medical record, the patients are, are generating all of this data and we really need to get it into the record, get it to the healthcare system so that, again, we can uh, work uh, with the patient and um, give them feedback about uh, their, their health behaviors. Um, so the other issue from a clinician's point of view is, of course, getting paid for the time that we review all of this information. Uh, there are uh, codes that we can use now uh, for assessing remote data. And uh, one of the things that we hope to study is if we implement that particular code, will that uh, generate sufficient revenue to cover the clinician and the time uh, that the system uh, uses uh, to go to, to implement that? So uh, that's the, the basic uh, story on, on what we've done, what we hope to do uh, in the future, and then I do want to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Agarwal, Kenyon uh, Crowley, and others uh, at the uh, Smith School uh, of Business, and the veterans, of course, that, that took part in the study. Are there any immediate questions for Nanette? Any clarifications? Yes. Correct. So uh, I think the, the mean A1C was 8.5, and so they were able to come down to 7.5. And, and really, the, the, those individuals that in, they were strongly c correlated with engagement, how, how much they used it. And of course, questions are, well, it's a new toy, right? We, we looked at them for a short period of time. Will they continue to use it? after a year or two years or three years, and it, those questions need to be answered as well. Hi, I, I'm wondering if there's like a third party system that could help with this where, so the doctors don't have the time and they also need to have the information processed in a way that they can easily scan when it comes time for the patient to be in front of the doctor. So I wonder if there's like a third party where that information the, they get paid because they do a lot of quantity on code, on the code, and then they can just simply pop that information back to the doctor to be able to use on the spot when they need it. Just, I don't know if that makes sense, but it just seems like the doctor's time and the doctor's ability to process the information when there's a whole bunch of it and make sense of, of the pattern, it, 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 I think there's a, a challenge there. There is a challenge there, and one of the things that we did with this particular trial was use the Certified Diabetes Educator. They are licensed providers, and they have the ability within very defined parameters to make recommendations for changes in therapy. So the diabetes educators can actually filter through a lot of that, and then those that need more intense scrutiny can be sent over uh, to the doctor or the nurse practitioner, the higher level of care. But honestly, the thing that I find from a practical point of view is that patients don't want to have to come to the doctor. And what we do in diabetes is mostly look at the blood sugars 
and say, okay, take this, do this, do that. Um, so I can see that if this is implemented in, an, in a sound way, that maybe the doctor visits are going to, the need to come to the doctor will go down. Then that'll save a lot in terms of time, resources, parking, transportation issues, because usually they're seeing a physician for other things in addition. So I, I think that we really have an opportunity to transform how we think about delivering care as well. Why don't we hold uh, questions, some more questions for later. Let me invite PJ up. And as PJ is getting set up, I also want to comment on the third party uh, idea that you brought up. So one of the areas of development is on the use of automated algorithms to be able to do exactly that, which is pre-process the data, identify areas that the clinician should focus attention on and not you know, clutter their minds with lots and lots of details. And I will tell you there are dozens of companies that will provide that service for enough here. money. <laughs> Sorry. In the end, it's about the money. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, morning. Almost lunchtime. <laughs> uh, just quick show of hands. How many people use uh, technology uh, for health behaviors and mobile health? Nice. Um, so I'm here in two roles. Uh, one is the uh, National Institutes for Health uh, Precision Medicine Initiative. Ritu talked about the precision medicine. Uh, I will also provide some linkages to that. Um, and um, NIH has funded a very large center called Participant Technology System Center. So I have a role of principal investigator for that technology center. Um, also, the founder of uh, um, Vibrant Health, uh, who is managing the center on behalf of uh, NIH. So we think about this also in the same way Dr. Besser talked about, and what Ritu has talked about is reimagining health. So before I dive too, too deep, I uh, want to just provide a couple of slides about what is the Precision Medicine Initiative, in particular the All of Us Research Program, and what are they doing by way of technology, and how that particular initiative stitches together with the conversation we are having here um, about uh, using technology for healthy behaviors. It all starts with research, public health research. And large-scale, longitudinal, data-driven research that can then inform the evidence um, from information to uh, provide the motivation. So uh, just a quick background on also what Riti talked about. Uh, President Obama announced a Precision Medicine Initiative in 2015. And this is the mission of the Precision Medicine Initiative. It's a very broad-based mission. And the key there was to be able to have a national technology platform that can be used for um, health sciences and health research to inform and over time use data science uh, to understand um, how diseases progress and how they can, um, how we can derive some patterns and cures from that data. At a high level, a 10 million cohort program, right? So in health research, we talk about you know, 100, 500, 2,000, 50,000. We're talking about a 10 million cohort that's gonna build over a five, 10 year uh, period using the same technology platform. That's the key. Um, Long-term engagement, reflecting the broad diversity of the US. So we talked earlier in the morning, there was a comment about how do we make sure that diversity is represented in health research. So this is a heavy focus on UBR, unrepresented in biomedical research. Data will inform thousands of research studies. So one technology platform 
that will incorporate thousands and thousands of sub-studies, be able to create new data sets, to be able to correlate data sets across studies. And it's funded by Congress as of now, $1.3 billion has been allocated over five years. And this is another view of um, what the program is going from, from a mission to how we will accomplish uh, from participant slash consumer enrollment uh, to a variety of data sources that would be aggregated, um, including surveys and assessments and wearable devices and genomics data, electronic health record data. Dr. Besser talked about environmental data and determinants of health, environmental factors, um, as well as combining that with lifestyles and behaviors data. So to study that person in holistically, and the point Ritu made earlier is how do we bring it from a 300 million people in the United States to a approach that is individualized, personalized. So the notion of going and transitioning from precision medicine, which is typically used in the oncology world, to precision health. How do we inform and help an, at every individual achieve precision health? And this is a platform development innovation funnel that goes uh, from, you know, start with a small data set and how over time, 10, 20 year period, you go from right to left. Data sets grow, research and scientific questions grow, and that then yields more uh, information. So from that being said, let me transition. That was about the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, now let me transition to um, what our organization does for the precision medicine, as well as a broader set of industry, academic, and public uh, private uh, partnership models that we have worked on. So this is a, what we're talking about is technology in a platform-based approach that one technology, one platform to address multiple use cases. And because the technology platform is able to do that, uh, that you have some really nice opportunities that open up. The technology itself is really divided in two parts. One that can help a consumer, a consumer, a participant, a patient, depending upon the use case. And the other is the care team, the research staff, the public health uh, professionals who need access to data. So that's kind of the left side, the management tools. The participant, consumer, patient is in the middle. You always have to, somebody has to start using technology. So that's why you have this recruitment, enrollment, consent, interventions, motivation in the middle. On the left side is what gives you insights, data, effectiveness, that can then help inform how the person can be more um, precise about using technology. And then that can apply to a variety of um, use cases we just talked about, from uh, chronic disease management to physical activity, diets and behaviors and sleep. So this is the overall framework um, that helps uh, uh, clinicians, researchers, providers, patients, consumers. And this is really a a behavior change platform um, that has multiple components in it for both uh, clinical and observational um, as well as intervention-based use cases. So on the left side, you see tools for researchers and providers and public health professionals. On the right side, you see uh, consumer-based experiences and participant-based experiences that go together. Uh, and this is uh, really just speaking to what Ritu talked about earlier, is that you have data sources on the left side, data collection. On the right side is what is being informed as adaptive interventions or motivations that go with a variety of different data. Um, and then these adapt over time on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. 
And then a couple of quick slides about how these technology platform and technology approaches for behavior change, how were these applied in clinical trials, in clinical research, biomedical research, as well as observational studies. So this is about a Mediterranean diet program and increasing the adherence to an evidence-based dietary regimen. So we conducted this at the George Washington uh, Hospital, George Washington University. And consistent uh, with what Nanette talked about, I think everybody that has deployed technology in these types of use cases has seen an increased adherence over a month, over three months, over six month period. And consistent with that, we had similar outcomes is uh, weight loss, and this was a biomarker uh, study, so we did three blood draws uh, before, during, and after, and there were clinical markers, biomarkers, that were, uh, you know, that did improve. So this is consistent with, you know, most of these studies. This one was a little bit of a outlier and really exciting. So this was about rehab, improving adherence for a head and neck cancer patient uh, with swallow therapy during treatment. So when they are going through radiation and other types of therapies, how can we help them increase swallow? It's a very, very different use case than a weight loss or a diabetes use case. Uh, and this was really heavily clinical use case where a patient's life um, really depended on doing swallow therapy um, in a very regimented fashion. So this crosses between you know, health information, health promotion, health education, chronic disease management, medication adherence. This was about opioid reduction. So we achieved almost 50% reduction in opioid for pain management. And this was also done at the Johns Hopkins um, where they were looking for cancer care. So this was a very interesting study that talks about using assessment, health promotion, wireless devices, self-reported data, adaptive care plans, and big data integration and clinical decision support all came together. So sounds like a relatively straightforward use case, but we had to um, validate at least a dozen sources of data and fuse them together to really understand what's going on and to be able to do medication titration uh, through technology. So this was a very exciting use case. And this use case was about um, obesity and cardiovascular risk reduction um, in the model of community-based participatory research, CBPR model. So this was done in multiple churches in Washington, DC, where we deploy technology, interactive technology, at a, a, a four different churches, and people will congregate around technology. They were all given wearable devices. They were monitoring, tracking, and it really changed how the community talked about technology, how they learned from each other, and how they encouraged each other. So our experiences are that technology by itself is not the answer. It is a critical piece that has to link to the physical world. The physical world could be my doctor, physical world could be my uh, provider, my caregiver at home, or the physical world in this case is my community I go to. And in churches we had um, ambassadors, local people who come to church that people look upon as uh, trusted sources. And they were the ambassadors for health and engaging community and educating them. So this was another different example of uh, different uh, technology-based approaches. Uh, so those were my uh, slides kind of sharing the experiences of large-scale technology implementation at a national level that is going to uh, form the basis. And, and we encourage similar large-scale adoptions uh, that are possible now. So a lot of good work has been done through uh, smaller technology pilots, 
but I think it's time to move to larger programs that can then derive insights from aggregate level of data that's being collected. Thank you very much. Any quick questions for uh, PJ? Sir? Yeah, we have that in the study. I'm happy to take it offline okay. and get you the information. The paper, the paper is also being published. Mike's coming. Hi, uh, I'm really excited to hear people talking about the All of Us study uh, here. Um, I work on, with uh, Odyssey, the um, obser observational uh, health data and informatics um, uh, collaborative, where w at least one of the All of Us centers is going to be using the Odyssey Common Data Model yeah. and the Odyssey Stack, which I imagine uh, the vibrant data model and stack would be an alternative, right? Uh, it, it, I think the, the, the goal for us at an All of Us program is to adapt and leverage different data models and don't create completely unique. So we want to be consistent with Odyssey or the big data commons model, um, the interoperability of EHR using sync for science and the fire. So we are looking for opportunities to learn and collaborate around the data models. That's critical. And, and the other thing I just want to, the most exciting thing probably for this audience, at least that I would be excited about, is the idea of the standard. So it's not just that we're getting 10 million patients and collecting longitudinal data about all of them, but that we're doing it with data standards yes. such that the analytic tools yep. are applicable right now yep. to lots of other data sets. Yes. So you don't even need those, and you can get citizen scientists on the 10 million as well. Absolutely, citizen scientists is definitely the goal to go. Clearly that has a lot of uh, challenges in terms of policy aspects um, and misuse of data. So that's really where mo a lot of effort is being spent to have a proper authorization-based systems to who gets the data. Of course, everybody has access to data, but how do you prevent misuse and fraud and abuse? Thank you, PJ. Uh, we're going to have to move on. If we have time at the end, we would love your question. I'm sorry. And we will, like, and we will have time at the end. Okay, good. <laughs> Angela Evett is going to uh, present the health policy uh, point of view on this right now. I'm with the Maryland Healthcare Commission. Um, I'm not sure if uh, folks have heard of the Maryland Healthcare Commission, but basically, we are um, a regulatory body under the Department of um, of Health. And uh, when when Mark asked me to present today um, on um, how we're changing healthy behaviors, um, I really wanted to come to speak about some of our telehealth projects, our telehealth funded projects, particularly those where technology is being um, used and engaged with the patient. We have projects where um, technology or telehealth is being used mostly by the provider and the patient is sort of feels like a, a bit of a third party. But what I'd like to highlight today is some of those projects uh, and some of those outcomes of those projects where a patient is really engaging in that technology. Um, before I do, I'd like to uh, touch on you know, why telehealth? Why, what is the promise that telehealth can provide? Um, so what we, what we hope that telehealth can do, um, and it's increasingly being shown in the literature, is that we can increase quality of care with telehealth, right? Improving access to specialists, uh, improving clinical outcomes, and engaging that patient. Um, and on the other side of reducing cost, um, if we're gonna make investments in telehealth technology, which cost, uh, what, what, are, what is our return on that investment? 
Um, and there's potential to reduce unnecessary ED uh, utilization, prevent avoidable transfers. So for example, um, a patient could be in a nursing home. You might have family members that are in nursing homes. After hours care um, might be uh, to call the physician on staff, um, which typically the patient is then transferred to the ED. Um, but with the use of telehealth, we have an opportunity to engage with a physician uh, and that patient and keep that patient where they are. Um, that sort of goes into satisfaction uh, of, of uh, the outcomes of, of telehealth is where we can really provide uh, the most appropriate care in a comfortable environment for that patient um, and increase um, access when care is needed the most. Um, a previous speaker talked about preventing um, uh, preventable care and being proactive in the patient's care where they are, um, and that's what we hope telehealth can do. But it's not without its challenges. Um, I've listed a few here, but um, it's certainly the list can go on. Um, from a pr policy perspective, uh, limited reimbursement is a significant challenge when it comes to telehealth. Um, technology uh, investments made by providers and hospitals aren't reimbursed through a traditional fee-for-service model uh, in care. So those uh, organizations and providers have to uh, invest that money without getting paid. Uh, in reimbursement, there is limited uh, reimbursement uh, through Medicare and Medicaid in the state of Maryland, but there are certain restrictions um, potentially on um, the Medicare side with uh, the patient needing to be in a rural area. Um, and then there's some limitations on Medicaid in terms of the types of providers that can provide telehealth and those services. Um, this is incrementally growing on both the Medicaid side and the Medicare side. Uh, fortunately, in the state of Maryland, we passed a law that required uh, private payers to reimburse for telehealth, uh, such as your Care First, your Aetna, if that, uh, uh, that service is covered uh, already in that benefit plan via face-to-face. -face. Um, we also have some limits around the widespread awareness of how to incorporate telehealth into a practice. So it's not easy as, you know, I'm gonna buy a laptop, um, um, implement Skype for business, and I'm ready to go. There's a lot of um, thought that needs to be uh, put in place, uh, and a lot of providers don't understand the, uh, the best practices around telehealth adoption. Um, and, and some of our pilot projects are aiming to, to provide that information. Um, also, a lack of innovative use cases. Um, so there are, there are a lot of ways to use technology, but um, the literature hasn't focused on or hasn't been able to show um, all those different types of use cases and, and what uh, is working best for what types of patients, what types of technology. Um, and then there's medical insurance li liability, private security issues, and licensure, um, but I can go on. So um, I'd like to highlight some of our uh, grant-funded projects. The Maryland Healthcare Commission um, does uh, policy in several, several different ways. Uh, we bring together our stakeholders in the industry to uh, address particular issues um, through either regulation or, or legislation. Uh, we do surveys to understand what, um, what, what providers are adopting technology, what are some of those challenges, um, and what we've decided uh, in terms of grants is to provide these demonstration projects. Um, so, we, uh, by law, were required to pull together a task force um, back in 2012 and 13. That task force um, was uh, represented industry throughout vendors, providers, uh, the healthcare community, um, and they requested the uh, implementation of demonstration projects. And not necessarily to, to find um, the, the scientific data in terms of health outcomes, but to really um, tell the story of how a practice, a hospital, a nursing home, is implementing technology, how did they do it, and share that with the industry. And that's what we, uh, we want our pilot projects to do. So uh, a couple of key projects I'm, I'm gonna highlight today um, are around two use cases. One being remote patient monitoring, and the other mobile health. Uh, remote patient monitoring, meaning a patient is provided with technology within their home. Uh, it could be a kitted device, usually a tablet, some peripherals, uh, blood pressure cuff, and, and the like, um, where a patient is taking readings uh, daily, 
Um, it could have also have a weight scale, and there's a nurse uh, within the organization that's monitoring that patient's uh, information um, and reaching out to the patient when um, uh, particular parameters are out of that individual's norm. Um, three organizations, Lorian Health Services, uh, a nursing home uh, organization, um, participated in one of our projects as well as Gilcrest Greater Living, um, which was a geriatric practice that provided uh, services to homebound patients, and Union Hospital Cecil County. All three um, provided remote patient monitoring in their own way uh, to their patients after they uh, were either discharged from their nursing home or discharged from the hospital. Um, and all three worked to focus on patients with chronic diseases, usually uh, CHF, CPOD, and diabetes. Our mobile health project, which still uh, continues, uh, is with uh, pediatrics at home and it's aiming to improve um, patients with asthma uh, in Baltimore City. So um, why remote patient monitoring? Uh, what, what our project hoped to do is to understand the, uh, the, the use of these technologies and what were the outcomes of the patients. Uh, a lot of the hospitals and nursing homes are looking at opportunities to engage with their patients after they're discharged to uh, decrease the uh, likelihood of that patient coming back, so being more proactive uh, in their care. What we learned from the projects is that continuing education support is required to ensure patients are uh, effectively using remote patient monitoring. Taking the technology home is one thing, but actually utilizing and understanding the technology is, is key. Um, the patients are, are less likely to decline patient monitoring when they're engaging uh, in the technology prior to discharge. So a lot of our projects, um, when the patient was either in the nursing home or in the hospital, was introduced to that technology, because these are usually patients that might not be technology savvy, have a cell phone, uh, are, are using technology in their day-to-day -day lives. So introducing that technology is, is key to make them comfortable so that when they are discharged home, they're willing to accept and, and use it. For example, uh, the Laureate at Homes folks would um, include the technology uh, within their, their uh, therapy room, um, and the patient and their family members were able to go on the device, uh, play around with it, see how it worked. Um, also, the remote patient monitoring device was also um, providing additional things to that patient, particularly the elderly were interested in, you know, family pictures and, and calendar reminders and other interested things that would come on that tablet and that would keep them more engaged. At the same time, they're able to um, take their blood pressure readings and, and uh, communicate if need be with that provider. Um, so that personal content wa was important. And then provider dashboards based on uh, selected performance indicators, meaning the, the nurse uh, at the hospital or at the nursing home was able to uh, track all of their patients that they were monitoring through an easy to read dashboard um, that would indicate when maybe uh, a particular patient didn't uh, complete their, their assessment for that day or was able to push out education to that patient based off of what their needs might be. Um, and also be alerted if um, the patient's um, vitals were maybe out of their own parameters and give that patient a call, even a video call uh, as well. Um, so I'm going to quickly highlight uh, some of the outcomes that our projects found. Um, again, these are demonstration projects, so um, there isn't any control groups. We usually looked at baseline data. Um, what the Lorient Home folks found uh, that about 97% of their uncontrolled diabetes patients maintained or improved, um, where 53% improved their A1Cs. Um, they also found similar improvements with their uh, CHF patients and hypertension patients. Um, and, and to point out in terms of the, the goal of reducing uh, readmissions back to the hospital, uh, what they found out was that their 22 patients um, were, were less likely to return to the hospital uh, because they were able to manage that patient within the home um, and the patient wasn't calling the ambulance to go back uh, to the hospital. Um, and 58% declined uh, in admission rate compared to their 12-month uh, baseline. The support area elders also is finding similar results in terms of reducing ED admissions. Um, 
uh, and our uh, Union Hospital also uh, had 48 uh, 30-day readmissions that were avoided. Uh, and based off of their estimates of having $7,000 being an ad admission to the hospital, um, they saved uh, over $300,000 which could easily uh, support um, the implementation of the technology. Um, in terms of our pediatric asthma uh, project, um, we're partnering with Peds at Home and a, uh, a startup um, uh, technology vendor, uh, which we've found to be really uh, beneficial because our, some of these startups are able to quickly customize their, their applications to meet the needs of the, the providers and to have that clinical uh, expertise provided into the development of their application. And that's sort of what we're seeing uh, with, with Peds at Home. Uh, basically, a patient gets uh, um, an application on their mobile device, uh, which walks through their, their asthma action plan uh, if, uh, if, if need be. Uh, that information is alerted back to the nurse who can reach out to that patient um, to make sure that they're controlling uh, their asthma appropriate, making changes uh, as needed. Um, patient is game engagement um, is, is doing really well preliminarily. Uh, patients are still using that technology even if they're not on the program um, and they're decreasing some utilization. So I included my, uh, web the website up there. We have reported on the, the projects. Uh, three reports on uh, 10 of the demonstration projects are available and provide more detail. Thank you. Any uh, one quick question for Angela? Yes, ma'am. Here comes the microphone. Um, would you be saying then that in your program, basically, you're, you have supportive technology, but your program routes through the lab, the lab technology as well? So it, the, are you talking about the peripherals that capture information on vitals? Th that? Uh, well, yes. Yes, but basically, does it refer always back to the lab technology laboratory? So for, for most of our projects, they didn't involve any, any laboratories. Um, the, the remote patient monitoring uh, that occurred uh, would capture just basic vitals through peripherals of the technology. Um, there, there was a project that um, had technology within a nursing home, um, and there was a certified lab on site that would, uh, they could actually utilize to provide information to that ED provider um, if ordered by, by that uh, physician. Um, and that helped uh, that ED provider have additional information um, um, while the patient was in the nursing home instead of transferring them to the ED to um, take that, those, um, uh, to do additional labs. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, try and... Uh, I'm Mark Zubro. I'm at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and uh, the health system. Um, my titles and stuff are maybe readable up there. Uh, and I'm uh, VP of telemedicine, and I work mostly in telemedicine now. Um, uh, my career has been very circuitous. I started out as an intensivist in a small town and have worked all the way back up to a university. Uh, one piece of information that I want to give that's not in my talk is uh, it's, you've heard this from several of the speakers, it's about the money. So if you take professional fees off the table, uh, which Kaiser does in California, 55% of their primary care visits are telemedicine visits. So think about that one. So when I was asked to um, uh, be part of this panel, uh, I, being the sharp guy that I am, said, I'm not sure I know what technology is, and I definitely don't know what healthy behavior is. Uh, so I went and looked it up and, in fact, uh, learned a lot. Um, the knowledge or use of uh, techniques of a profession, art, or science is the definition of technology. So theoretic physics would not be technology, uh, whereas uh, practical applications is technology. And I want to emphasize the practical. 
And healthy behavior, if you read through that definition, you'll notice it doesn't say anything about doctors or advanced practitioners or nurses. It really puts the onus on the patient. So uh, I thought that was also interesting. Some of this is going to be repetitive. I'm going to give you a little flavor, uh, different flavor on it, but uh, very quickly because of our timeline. Uh, where do I think we're going to use technology uh, in the short term? Uh, I think it's going to be patient sensing devices, and I think we're about to have an explosion of these. And one of the key things that I think everybody needs to keep in mind is just because we can measure it doesn't mean we should. And in fact, I would really emphasize to everybody that when you're looking at technology and looking at devices, look for actionable information. So when the Fitbit first came out, I kept thinking, I don't really care how many steps I take. And I have to tell you, I'm not allowed to say that in public because my daughter does the advertising for Fitbit. But nonetheless, <laughs> I keep telling her, this is going to disappear. But I learned something a couple of months ago that what they're using Fitbits for is to see if the elderly in nursing homes are moving. Mm -hmm. So they're checking their Fitbits, and it's uploading to a central computer, and they're seeing which of the uh, uh, residents are actually doing daily activity. That's an actionable application as far as I'm concerned. So I hope everybody sees where I'm going with that. A couple of these, uh, I'm not sure, is this pointer work? Um, so this here is a, uh, that's not English, this device is a um, uh, alcohol meter. So if you want to talk about healthy behavior, having a couple drinks, uh, you uh, blow into that, that device is uh, $79, and it will tell you if your blood alcohol level is uh, high enough where it's not safe for you to drive. That's a healthy behavior. Not only is that healthy for the person who's been drinking, it's healthy for me because I might be out on the street. This is a uh, sensing device uh, for a diabetes patient that actually will measure ketone production, which is an incredibly sensitive uh, marker of uh, diabetic, uh, not, uh, diabetes out of control. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Steely, uh, Steinle would uh, be much better at it than me. But um, so uh, this would alert the patient that they uh, need to check, check their sugar or need to make some kind of adjustment. And I will uh, come back to this several times, but as far as I'm concerned, your smartphone is your biggest and best medical device. I will submit to you that your smartphone should be your medical vault and record. Uh, I think one of the big mistakes, and, and I, I absolutely laud uh, President Obama for everything he did uh, for uh, population health and uh, information technology, but I think they kind of blew it when they made everything hospital-centric. I think it should be patient-centric, and I think we should all walk around with our information. Uh, for those college students or graduate students, uh, the statistics are impressive that you're going to move every three to five years. Uh, and how good is it to have all your records at the University of Maryland uh, when you're going to be in California in five years and Utah five years after that? Makes it kind of tough. Uh, I think Microsoft had it correct that we should be using things like their healthcare vault, etc. Another concept that I want to put out there is what I call the remote physical examination. Uh, this is actually an area of research that we're actively involved in right now. I've published several papers. Um, and uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, unrealistic expectation of visiting the doctor, and unless the doctor touches you, you don't feel it's a good doctor. The truth of the matter is the amount of information a physician gets from physical examination <coughs> is incredibly small. Okay, and even in a routine physical examination, if the physician doesn't touch you to examine you, then he or she cannot get paid, which is the only reason they're really dragging into the office. The rest of it can be done uh, through other mediums. And uh, again, it's this pay for performance, so to speak, uh, that uh, creates these problems. Uh, but we have the ability now to check somebody's retina. So in diabetes, this is an iPhone that has an attachment that's a couple hundred bucks. You could do retinal scans from home and upload them to your ophthalmologist so you don't have to keep coming in. And uh, every three to six months, uh, we know if you need laser th uh, therapy, et cetera. Uh, can you imagine the mother or the working parents? I shouldn't say mother. The working parents both have full-time jobs. Their three-year-old gets up and says, I have an earache. 
That means one of those parents takes a day off from work to go to see the doctor, okay? So that's a financial imposition. What about if they actually had a device like this and they actually cost $300, you could put it right on your iPhone, look at the, you know, uh, bring up the child's eardrum and upload it to their physician and say, you know what, I think we should give antibiotics or we shouldn't and make the clinical decision there. This is what kind of technology is really helping. It's a financial imposition for these parents. And again, I venture the iPhone here. There are all kind of apps, as everybody's alluded to. There's an app that can uh, count your heart rate by your head imperceptibly bobs, and you move one pixel. So uh, HP has an app that will count your heart rate or respiratory rate that way. We don't know what to do with these technologies, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, so the next big uh, area which I think technology is going uh, is the Human Genome Project, and everybody should be familiar with that. Uh, for more than a billion dollars, the uh, government has pretty much paid for us uh, uh, outlining or defining the human genome. And why do I think that's a good technology for health is that we now know there are certain genes that give you a predisposition, if not almost a guarantee to certain diseases. And what if when you were born or three years old, you had this uh, genome looked at and it told you if you had one of these defects? Uh, retinitis pigmentosa is a rare disease, but leads to blindness. There is actually a gene therapy cure for retinitis pigmentosa now, and I say cure hesitantly because unfortunately they give it too late down the road where a patient already has severe impairment. But if you knew that a three-year-old was going to be blind by the time he or she was 25 years old, and then you embarked on the gene therapy when they were age five rather than age 25, could we prevent that blindness? What's the cost to society to prevent somebody from being blind? You take a dependent person and make, keep them independent, et cetera. A couple of us have high cholesterol. A lot of us get heart disease. Uh, and unfortunately, it's uh, still, well, now it's the number two killer, but nonetheless, we know that there are certain genetic markers which absolutely will predict hypercholesterolemia. And uh, if you knew that ahead of time, maybe starting to treat people at 16 rather than 46, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time, but uh, we know a lot about mutations. The next technology, which I think is um, very important, uh, which was alluded to by a couple of the other speakers, is artificial intelligence. The reality is the first day of medical school, and I don't know if there are any physicians here, um, first day of medical school, every medical student is told 90 to 95% of medicine is the history, even though we spend way more time on physical examination and technology. Well, the truth of the matter is they're right. And there is no reason that a doctor has to elicit this history. Uh, as you know, people get more and more tech savvy and we get smarter and smarter ways of asking questions and artificial intelligence that if somebody says I have a cough, it leads them down this road versus the next road if somebody says I have a headache, et cetera. There is no reason that we should spend 80% of our time in a doctor's office talking about symptoms that could be elicited ahead of time. In fact, with artificial intelligence, and we know that Watson actually can do this now, and I know some of the work is being done here at College Park, uh, can actually come to a great differential diagnosis and be uh, probably 85% accurate, much more accurate than the average physician. And the internet. I think the internet is a huge advantage for healthcare. Uh, I was in Delaware before I came to uh, Maryland, and Delaware is heavily populated with engineers, and you always knew an engineer uh, when they came to the office because they had done their internet search and they had a book compiled with all the data. And uh, in this day and age, if you're a physician, you have to know that your educated patient is going to come in with more information than you have. And this actually is a huge challenge of practicing medicine because not only do you have to reach your differential diagnosis, your conclusion, uh, very quickly come to a therapeutic decision and lay out a plan of care for the patient, you have to go refute them that they probably don't have susukamushi when they just have a common cold. And uh, that actually takes a lot more time than the not educated patient who, you know, kind of says, okay, doc, what do you think? 
And uh, in fact, uh, I think the internet's wonderful, and I think patients should spend a lot of time in the internet, on the internet and actually resolve their questions. Uh, Tim uh, uh, Berners-Lee and others who made the internet totally open access and created the World Wide Web, they did us a huge favor. Uh, and uh, we should definitely be taking advantage of this in healthcare. We're not. We're just scratching the surface. And I think uh, I'll stop there, and this opens for general questions uh, for any of the panelists. Thank you. So we have about uh, six minutes left in the panel between us and lunch, so please uh, pose questions to any of one of the panelists. Go ahead. Okay, awesome. I hope I don't scream into this. So I think um, mobile health and telehealth is great for rural areas as well, where you know you can really reach those populations that don't have access to all these doctors. However, I'm curious in terms of what is required on the patient side in terms of connectivity, and then what adaptations have been made in regards to that. So let me start off with that because pretty much this is what I do. Um, the connectivity piece is actually a big problem in rural health. There's a concept uh, of what's called the last mile, uh, if you're familiar with it. And the last mile is basically getting data access from main trunks into homes. And uh, believe it or not, the biggest grant uh, come from the Department of Agriculture because of the uh, more rural states. Uh, the other problem is cell towers. So everybody thinks cell phones are great. There are large swaths of rural America where there's not good cell uh, service. So we deal with this a couple of ways. We run into this problem uh, to a minor extent on the Eastern Shore. The Eastern Shore, believe it or not, there are areas that are as rural as Western Kansas. I apologize for anybody from Kansas. Um, but um, we actually bring the technology to the patient. So we will stick a uh, tablet in an Uber and take it to the patient have the telemedicine encounter, and then the Uber brings the technology home. And uh, if we want to have one of those sensing devices or examination devices, particularly ultrasound is where uh, some of our research is going now. We think ultrasound is a stethoscope of the future. I think the ultrasound is a stethoscope of now. Um, I'm glad the dean's not here. Um, but anyhow, um, you know, so as technology gets better and better uh, and cheaper and cheaper, uh, you could bring the technology to the patient. You could bring the patient to pockets of telehealth. So you might not want the patient or the patient doesn't want to drive to a hospital, but maybe they drive to a local gymnasium that has internet service. And we actually are standing up a program now to do uh, rehab. So we're going to have group rehab uh, and do it over the airways uh, for rural areas. So they don't have to drive, you know, take the bridge and drive three hours to Baltimore. They just have to drive 20 minutes to their local gymnasium, that sort of thing. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Hey, my name is Jenny Owens, and I work at The Grid at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. So I'm really interested in artificial intelligence and the ability to collect information autonomously. Like, just personally, to share a little bit of my story, I, get, I, have, mon I have migraine, and so they tell you, keep a journal. So it's like a part-time job to keep track of what I'm eating, what the weather is, was I stressed out, how much did I exercise, did I drink red wine, did I eat cheese? You know, like, it's like a part-time job to track it all. Like, I'm waiting and interested in, you know, can the iPhone know what the weather is because it knows where I am? You know, could it do my stress level if it had my Fitbit? Like, is there a way, is there potential in collecting information autonomously so it's easier on the user and, and a way to make sense of that data? Like, I'm just curious if you know anything about that. So the answer is absolutely yes. It requires some pretty creative programming. Uh, this device, which I didn't spend time on, is actually what's called an event monitor. And that's an iPhone, where if you think your heart rates, yeah, we use event monitors for uh, patients that feel like they're getting very rapid heart rates. And you know, unless you catch it once a month, you're not going to. So they put that device on the back of their iPhone. They put fingers from each hand on there. It will capture that heart rate. So it's made that diagnosis a lot better, and it uploads it. So in your situation, there's no reason that you couldn't click on something on your iPhone, and it automatically uploads the, uploads the weather from that day. Uh, you could have a pick list that I eat, drink, or ingest whatever. Sure, that just takes programming. That's not really AI as much as somebody just has to create the program. 
There was a question here? One last question. You've had your hand up for a while. So you in the second row. Yeah. Uh, I work in the Department of Kinesiology in the School of Public Health here. Um, I have been working with uh, uh, some of the companies, including Samsung, Under Armour, and other companies, uh, uh, particularly for, their, uh, for the development of their uh, hardware and software uh, technologies, uh, especially for the physical activity monitoring and um, uh, continuous non-invasive uh, monitoring of virus signs. Uh, over the last several years, uh, I know that it is important to uh, develop our technology for the uh, continuous non-invasive uh, monitoring of uh, patients and non-patients. But I always had this question uh, about the uh, robustness of the current technology. I just wanted to hear about the, your wisdom on it. Would you like to address yeah, that? I you know, that's one of the areas of research, right? Health research, technology research. We hear so many times that you take a Fitbit, you take an Apple Watch, you take an Android gear, and you take passive sensing in the phone that does non-invasive measurements of physical activity, sleep, and other things, and you compare them, and there is a 100% variability across them. Then the question you ask is, is that being used for, uh, for, for, for calorie purposes? Is it being used for calories burned purposes? Or what Mark mentioned, is it being used as an indicator of the use case, which is, are people moving? And approximately how much, whether it's 1,000 steps or 5,000 steps, is the second measure. Yeah, you were saying something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think we need to recognize that the state of the art of the technology is not where we want it and need it to be for some of the interventions that uh, involve actual disease conditions, right? But to PJ's point, we are at a happy place now. I think technology developments with sophisticated machinery and more ability to do parallel processing and ma more ability to do really, uh, you know, sort of multi uh, faceted data processing, we'll eventually get there. So uh, we're not a mature science and yet. I, I can just add to that, um, just like Mark <laughs> mentioned. I, I see it every day. So my mother is about 80 years old, and she doesn't know much English, no use of technology. But we gave her Android phone four years ago. She lives with us, and this is a LG or a Samsung phone. And we just replaced it about six months ago. And right on her home page is the passively sensed steps from the phone. So she doesn't have to wear anything. She doesn't like to wear anything. And here we are using it every day. Mom, let's take a look at your phone. Thousand steps. Oh, really? I only did 1,000 today. The only thing that matters is the number, yeah. relative right. number. Right. Oh, but you did 4,000 yesterday, Mom. Yeah, last three days, it's been cold. I haven't gone out. Mm -hmm. That's the only conversation. You got to increase, do, do more, right. because you did right. 4,000 three years ago, uh, uh, three days ago. Right. And that, to us, is a very good use of that, that capability. Well, on that uh, optimistic note, <laughs> <laughs> let's look forward to uh, lots of uh, advancements in technology so we can have a healthier public. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.